So, Tony, this yesterday is, uh, well, everything that I've been figuring out lately shares some of your mental DNA. So that is to say, uh, the bits and pieces, like the, the way that I organize information, to me, it's like picking up pieces of sand that I don't own yet. And I only want pieces of sand that are different from ones I already have. So I only need one of each one. Uh, but when you have that kind of, you know, mental attitude, mental appetite, after a while, you, you don't, it's not obvious where to look, you know, because you go through a whole beach, right? All the sand that's slightly different, but kind of the same is together. So it's really hard to miss uh, uh, you know, it's hard to figure out what, what you still have to know. Your, your things that you know you don't know disappear if you care about not knowing things. That's a different way to say that. If you actively are bothered by what you don't know and you are making that pile smaller as much as possible, eventually it gets smaller. Uh, you hit roadblocks, but through the course of, you know, interaction, it's the little tiny things that always seem to make the difference over time. So the way that we interact, you know, the, the bouncing of energies, the, the different perspectives, the, the very specific oscillation from negative to positive frequency. This idea doesn't happen without both of them working together in the other direction uh, with the ability to change direction uh, over time to whatever, you know, looks like it's got the most new information that hasn't been explored yet. So this was one of those ideas and it was a big one. So this entire series could be described as a study in mental languages. Uh, if nothing else, each of these different lectures could be a standalone uh, 90 minute presentation on one specific language of thought. So uh, that's one way to do it. You could view it many other ways. I think they all work together to make one language that understands many different types of thought. But it doesn't have to be that way. You know, you can break it down and grab little pieces of it that stand apart on their own. But this one was special. This idea was special because up until now, every language of thought that I've discussed has separate boundaries that need to be very clearly defined to make that language behave the way that it does. Meaning, uh, uh, if I was going to do a process like developing film in a dark room, I would need to say that so long as I'm talking about developing film in a dark room, I need to be inside the dark room or none of my rules make any sense. Well, you want to hang the clothesline up and shine the red light over this when you're outside in direct sunlight and your film is exposed and ruined. None of it works. All of the steps could be done perfectly, but because the boundary is not properly recognized, the, the information turns to nonsense. So it loses its specific utility. And the reason I like the specific utility is because those specific situations seem to come up. And so it's kind of like, well, I keep finding myself in this situation. I might as well learn what's up, uh, how to see it, how it works, where it's born, how it dies, how to transition it, how it can go good, how it can go bad, how to recognize the signs, how to prevent a bad situation from happening before it does. That's usually small decisions can make that happen if they're made soon enough. It's if they're not seen, not corrected, not intervened before they have time to grow to these large problems that well, then you need bigger solutions that, that are not as fun and, and are more work and more people suffer because well, they put a lot of work into making things go wrong. <laughs> people love their kids, even if they're ugly. Same is true for their ideas. The more effort they put into raising an idea, the more they're going to treat it like it's one of their own, whether it deserves it or not. I can see how that would work. If your family, you know, if your brother's getting punched, and, you know, his fault or not, you're going to try and get him out of there at least. At least I would. I wouldn't want to watch my brother get beat to a pulp, you know, if I could do something about it. 
especially if he's the kind of brother that I know is, is not a bad guy. Like, if they have my benefit of the doubt, that's got to extend when shit goes south. I can't just believe in them when things are all right, you know? So that's kind of what I feel. The people feel that way about their ideas, too. In fact, they, they cling to them even harder when shit gets rough. They're all I got. I got to count on you. So that brings me to today's title. Uh, today's title. Do I have it? Hold up. The Cognitive Rosetta Stone. The Power of Irrelevance. I is greater than you. So that title is three sentences, three statements. And the number three has a lot of significance in this lecture series because for the moment being, if you remove the, the neural network around the liver, which decides which emotional uh, chemicals need to be released to the body in real time, um, that system is getting output that is produced by the other three. So it's a different, different ball of wax. I'm just talking about the stuff up here today. Your, your, your conscious mind, your subconscious mind, and your gut brain, your survival system. So fight, flight, feeding, and mating. That's your gut brain. Your conscious mind, your memory, and your pattern recognition. And then your conscious mind, your decision making, your ability to string things together in a line, A plus B plus C equals D. And I know what A and B are made of. And I can say what C and D are made of. And I can say that two of C equals one A. So it's really A plus B plus two A equals D. And then you can say D is equal. Yeah, you can, you can do a lot with that. And that's all the conscious mind. So I list this title three times in three different languages because each one of those statements is a different mental language of thought designed to speak to one of these three languages inside us. And all of those three things are saying the same thing at the same time. So this is an internal Rosetta Stone as much as it is a communicative one. So let's start with that title then. The Cognitive Rosetta Stone. This speaks to the subconscious mind. This is a two-dimensional idea. All right? It's, it's got direction. It's got length and width because your subconscious has length and width. Your subconscious is a web. It connects things like that. There's coordinates and, and all sorts of stuff where you're, everything you've remembered is in there all at once and you pluck from that. So that's the promise to the subconscious and your pattern recognition. That's where it should be stored. So it's, it's directions for where this belongs in the memory, the cognitive Rosetta Stone, the thing that translates it all. All right, so the next one, the utility, or, or no, the power of irrelevance, the power and utility, I'll, I'll say the same, because it's the same, power and utility are the same thing uh, when you get down to it. The power and utility of irrelevance, that title, that part of the title is speaking to the conscious mind. The decision to make about relevance and why, it's a, it's a decision and a justification. It's a reaction and a reaction to it. It's a one-dimensional thought, which is how your conscious mind works. It goes in a line. Train of thought. That's most consciousnesses move in a line. Uh, when they're broken, like mine is, when your attention span is broken, that's when that goes away. <laughs> so if it's a happy accident that I can look at things more than one way, I just get one-fourth the amount of time to figure out what's going on. Uh, that's the trade-off. Uh, pros and cons, really. You can see a lot more, but it's very hard to calm down. That's one of them. Uh, you're either scared or you're excited. Either way, meditation is going to be a thing you want. <laughs> that's how you know it's an excitement problem. Uh, there's some sort of anxiety if calming down is an issue. Well, otherwise, you'd be calm already. Uh, so that's the, the second meaning of that title. It speaks to the conscious mind. And finally, the equation at the end, it's three symbols. It's not, I'm, I'm not even writing it out. I greater than symbol, like in math, like four is greater than three. I greater than you. That's speaking to the gut brain. And that's the decision 
that powers all conversations of irrelevance. And that's what makes it the Rosetta Stone. Because the decision is the same every time that this phrase or phrases like it are uttered. And that's what this lecture is going to be about today is how to spot that and what it means because it's it's how to understand anybody. Even if they don't really understand themselves. And a little bit of it is going to be how to try to, to work with that. But you're going to try because it takes two people to have a conversation. I don't care how good you are uh, or how big your points are. If nobody else is interacting ever, you're just talking to yourself. And so if you've got a lot of information to share, there's a difference between getting somebody caught up and, and catching someone up for all time. Like I eventually, like certain people, depending on what we're interested in, I will run out of things to say to them. Is it because they're not interesting? No, it's because I had a lot to catch up from not having known them my entire life. There's a lot to know about a human being. And there's a lot to know about me uh, if you're going to get a well-rounded view of myself. And in my language skills, you know, before I started developing all this, were, were inefficient. So the, 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 the progress was slow over time. But eventually, you know, we stick around me long enough and we've had all the conversations and we said all the interesting things. And I remember them because I have an eidetic memory for that. So, you know, maybe we replay the greatest hits every now and again and we have the same conversation slightly different more than once. Okay, that's like watching a rerun of Gilligan's Island. We'll do it if nothing else is on. Uh, you might even have a chuckle or two, but it's not as satisfying as, you know, something that you haven't done yet. That's just the way the brain and pattern recognition works. Um, the only time it's interesting is if you keep trying to figure something out and you keep trying different and you're still left with the same mystery. A mystery that takes a while to solve, you know, that can be satisfying. But eventually you get through those too. And you're just left with, knowing a person. And then all you got to really do is keep them updated over time and love them as much as you want, <laughs> as much as they want to be in your life. You know, you just make that decision and commit to it from there. But how do you know when that's effective? Well, there's 30 some other lectures on how to do that in these little narrow windows. Maybe you don't know 10 languages of thought. Maybe you can't stop learning them, or maybe you, maybe you don't have this compulsion that I do, where I need to keep learning different ways that people say things so that I can understand them. I've got problems with not knowing what's going on. I never knew what was going on when I was a kid. It was too chaotic. It was too violent. You could do good thing and get punished. You could do a bad thing and get off scot-free. You could get punished for doing a bad thing, and you could get rewarded for doing a good thing. There was no, it didn't matter. I didn't know what mattered. People didn't keep their word when I was young, so I couldn't trust them, but you can find out how to trust. You know, I was never taught proper trust. I would just, uh, the only thing I was taught about proper trust was don't. <laughs> That's terrible advice. You can't trust anybody, and here's why, and I learned a lot of reasons. I tell you what, a lot of those reasons have truth in them. There are reasons you shouldn't trust people, but you need to know what those reasons are before you make that call. If that is your default position, you are going, you're doing garbage in, garbage out. You're going to end with the conclusion you started with, which is what all the previous lectures are about. So if you have a mistrusting personality, that is you putting that into motion and you getting it back. Why? Because nobody else wants it. <laughs> Nobody wants to deal with somebody who doesn't trust them. That includes you. That's your whole motivation. So why are you acting all suspicious all the time? And that's going to get you out of the cycle? No, you're going to build a wall. Uh, that's exactly the thing you're trying to avoid. That's how that works, equal and opposite. And what hides behind that? Is I greater than you? Oh, it's okay when I do it. I have a good reason to be suspicious. I'm not somebody else. I'm me. 
Yeah. And if you're very close to yourself and very far from everyone else, you are going to look bigger by comparison. Of course, my opinion matters more. <laughs> I can see it better. Larger. Um, so the point is maybe you've only got this much room where whatever talent you have lets you see things very clear. That's a good thing to have and a good thing to hold on to because if you can look at the thing and know it's right, even if someone tries to change it on a very small scale, you can know where it's wrong and how to fix it and how not to destroy everything else. If all of those things are true, you can trust your eyes. And you can trust your instincts enough to ask questions that aren't dumb. Ask questions that will get you closer to an answer than they will further away. But where you'll run into problems, like every other human being, is these are like different languages. The Tower of Babel in the Bible is, is, a, is a, a wonderfully accurate metaphor for why people split apart. They, they don't know how to talk to each other. And their whole calibration is built on the decision of good versus evil. And if I is greater than you, and I decide what is good, and you decide something different, the other person loses every time, even if the difference is that small, because a man can't serve more than two masters, good or evil. The best we have to describe that is the lesser of evil. Well, that's still evil. It's not good enough. Stop patting yourself on the back because the, the best you could do was, was, was a small amount of evil. Try a small amount of good. <laughs> you'll, get, you'll get better results. And if your small amount of good is large enough, you will break even with entropy and your life won't get worse. And if you're if your small amount of good is actually a large amount of good compared to what everyone else is doing, you will surpass entropy and start to grow your opportunities and connections. And the reason for that is simple. More people will want to play with you. More people will want to be on your team. More people will say, you can bring folks together. You can make my project work. You are good for my success because you know how to be more than you. You can be me too. And if I'm greater than you, but you're me, you're just as great as me. And guess what? Now you're on equal terms. You're finally having a conversation at that point where both of you are speaking the same language. But the thing that needs to be corrected first is that one measurement. And so that's why I'm telling you where this measurement hides, because it's very deep. This one hides beneath the ultimate shame. All right. So this is if you go to the Garden of Eden. And then if you go on the emotional wavelength, so I'm, I'm uniting two metaphors here and explaining them the same thing differently, two different ways at the same time. That graph where I showed anger, desire, fear, anger, desire, fear, those are the order in the emotional wavelength. If you're going up or down frequency, fear is the lowest, desire is above that, anger is above that, one, two, three. The Garden of Eden, the knowledge of good and evil, all right. The desire to know good and evil produces toward or away, towards good, away from evil. Fight what is evil, defend what is good, run from what is evil, fight in the name of good, uh, fight for evil. Fight against good. All of those are decisions that have direction. So the point is, why? Why is the question? Because every question that people ask seems to stop at one of those three things. It's what I want. That's the most honest answer. Why do you want it? I don't know. 
That just makes me so angry. Why does it make you angry? It's just not right. It's bad. It's evil. Okay. Next one. I just can't stand that. I want it to be far away from me as possible. Okay. I want to get away from it. It's bad. It makes me feel bad. Towards away. But why? Well, here's why. So this is, this is that, that's where most of humanity lives all the time. And this is kind of what Nietzsche was saying when he wrote the book Beyond Good and Evil. I'm taking this, in my opinion, other Nietzsche scholars may, may differ. Uh, maybe they'll be right. Maybe they can help me improve my theories. But if I disagree with something that Nietzsche has laid out, I'm more interested in knowing that than I am in knowing that I've used the same words that he used to make his point. Because if that's the point that you're making, after 30 some lectures about how to convert mental languages into this, it's your lost cause. Uh, you should be able to connect those dots by now on your own with having words sound different than you expected them to. There's no excuse anymore if you watch these in order. There's no more lying to yourself about what you can and can't understand. It's what you will and won't understand at this point. This is why these lectures I saved for last is they're very difficult to prove simply. They're easy to prove if you follow enough steps and you check every one. So that's why this lecture is here. And that's why some of the explanations are what they are. So beyond good and evil gets to the point where who is really calling the shots? Is it you or is it good and evil? Who is your master? Really? And I'll tell you the answer. Almost every time the buck stops with me or the buck stops with I. It's a better way to say that. For every individual person, they are the center of it. Who else is it going to be? Nobody else has their emotional control box hooked up to their memory, hooked up to their conscious mind. They own the means of production on every level. And what they do with those means of production is as different as there are people. How people abuse those means of production is just as vast. And how people use those means of production to grow the world around them is also just as vast. So what they do with it doesn't matter at this point. It's who is running the show. And... This whole lecture has been stripping away the layers upon layers upon layers that people build over their beautiful collection of brain meats and body works. Brain and body works, 25% off. Uh, I'll be sending you a, a coupon in the mail for, for Bed Bath & Beyond at some point for 25% for off. It's a joint partnership. So watch your mailbox, and if you see that coupon from Bed Bath & Beyond, you'll know I was trying to reach out to you. Uh, it might not have my name on it because I'm a silent partner. They, they probably don't even know this is happening. <laughs> uh, I got myself off track with a silly joke. Uh, the point is, the point is, when the chips are down, people will let you know who is in charge of what they think and feel, and it's them. Because even if they don't like what's going on, they can still choose to piss and moan about it. Or they can choose to grin and bear it. Or they can choose to explain it away. Or they can choose to say it is what it is. Or they can choose to say there's nothing I can't do. Or they can say, wait till they get a load of me now. Or they can choose to say, here's what I'm going to do in the next five minutes that I have control over to make my life better. Here's what I'm going to have done by next week. Here's what I'm going to have done in a year. And they're not going to take a day off. Those are all choices. They all happen one moment at a time. So that's not the focus, what people do with their choices. The options are limited. The point is the choices are there. It's like Omek from the Legends of the Hidden, Hidden Temple. The choices are yours and yours alone. And then you get grabbed by the temple guards and don't win a free trip to Disneyland, even though they've been advertising it for every episode for a year. 
<laughs> Free advertising. Legends of the Hidden Temple, everybody. Uh, the choices are yours and yours alone. So now I'm finally ready to talk about this because that's the last layer that hides above this is ownership. Who has ownership of your life? Well, you ask different people, they'll tell you different things, but they have one thing in common. They're the one telling you. That's got to mean something. Mom isn't telling you. <laughs> Someone doesn't have their power of attorney. So to go back to the title, the cognitive Rosetta Stone, the declaration of relevance. I am greater than you. Every mental language of thought has a version of this phrase. And do not underestimate the power of something that is so broad. It is knowing how to say the same thing to every person who has ever had an idea and have yourself be perfectly understood. It's the cheat code if you know how to get through it. Because just because you make it to that point doesn't mean you make it past that point. If you make it to a point that you don't get past, that is a problem that you can't get past. It's a running gag in the joke that is your life. The problem is ironic enough. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, when it's your life, and you're the one calling the shots. Comedy does not need to come in threes. Comedy will work together in threes to keep you there. Body, mind, and spirit. Conscious mind, subconscious mind, and gut brain. They all love to play the same joke when you're not getting it right. Because your bullshit detector is too good. And the best you can do when you bullshit yourself is take the long way around. So... I want to talk about that phrase. I don't see why that matters. I don't see how that's connected. I don't see how that's relevant. That's not what I'm talking about. That's not what I want to talk about. That's not where I'm going. I don't see how that connects to my goal. I don't see why I need to discuss this. I don't even see the need to see why I think about this. All of those things have the same thing in common. Brain equals no. So maybe there's reasons for that. See, that's the situation. There should be a reaction to that situation, not a decision made at that situation's existence. That's a choice. So we've talked about how to make good choices in this lecture series before. You don't cut your logic out. You don't cut your emotion out. You don't cut your reaction around. You don't cut your reaction out. You keep thinking about it until all three of them say the same thing. And the one that's going to be the furthest behind is your logic, which means your first reaction is probably going to be wrong because your first reaction uses the simplest system in your brain to make decisions. It's the least capable of explaining things. It just knows forward and back. which is why the order of operations is important. That's why we did that whole lecture on memory. That's why if you're going to improve this problem, you need to train your emotions to shut the fuck up for one minute. Not because they can't be heard, but because they can't be so loud, no one else gets to go. Because the things that build are the smallest things. So here's how you recognize relevance. Uh, as a stumbling block. And here's what that phrase means. Anytime you hear a version of that phrase, here is the translation. You have stopped speaking my mental language. I don't understand what you're talking about at all. That's the declaration. And there's a reason every mental language of thought has this phrase. It's because every mental language of thought runs into this problem. 
we can't know what we are talking about unless we communicate what we're talking about. And if we try to decide if communication is wise before we know what's going on, we will not get the information. So it, it is an intentional cutting off of learning to speak a new language. That's what it is. It's a denial. It's a rejection of understanding. And let me give you the counter for it because I love counters. So this is a mental Aikido move. I've updated my playbook. This is the secret grandmaster five finger death punch that will bring any conversation with an honest man to peaceful resolution for the good of both. And it will bring to head anyone who has deceit in their heart who wishes to work against you in favor of themselves. This same move does all of that. And here's what it is. So I'm going to set the stage and watch. You can practice it. Practice it in the mirror first because it might sound a little weird. Um, but I have a disclaimer before I, before I share the counter to this because there's a price. There's a price to learning this. And the price is you can never use the phrase, I don't see why that matters again, without being able to explain exactly why, without knowing exactly how you're being an asshole. So that's the cost. It opens the universe by making you small. I is no longer greater than you if you use this. You can no longer hide behind it. Not without reasons you perfectly understand. I said that, most of the people here, I'm assuming, if you've watched from one to this one, you've got a tougher existential chin than that. Uh, some of the other things to get through that you'll cover in early chapters, like how to make peace with past trauma and, and how, to, how to recognize that, that you're small in other ways that are easy to fix, as long as you can say I'm small when it comes to handling my reactions. I handle them poorly sometimes. Oh no, I've seen grown men, 60 years old, crumble pathetically at the assumption that they might be mistaken and no amount of babying them or hand-holding them can cover the gaping wound in their ego because they have let it fester and rot out the floor like the car that Al Bundy drove and married with children. They are the Dodge with 1 million miles that they're proud of, that they have to push out of the driveway to get it going. And they have to push it home too. They can't let it go because it's the only car they got. And it's holding them back, weighing them down. So here's how to find out if you're having a conversation with someone who gives a shit about you. When the conversation reaches the point, I don't see how that matters. All right, so I've just heard that. There's the mental Aikido move. I don't see how that matters. We're not gonna talk about this and put boundaries up over everything and we're never gonna talk about that again. Ooh, that's, the, uh, that's the setup. That's the energy coming towards you. It's the human equivalent of I wanna quit. It's I give up. Don't go any further. If it was a snake, it would be the rattle. Here's what, I, here's what I've started saying to that, to terrific effect. I understand you don't see how that matters. I think it matters enough that I wanna talk about it. Do you matter more than I do in this conversation? That's it. You shut up after that, because why? because there's no one answer to that. This is not how to make the problem go away. That's everything else. This is how to get through the problem, which means there's more than one step, which means the first step is getting permission to talk about the problem. This is step one, finding out what the problem is. Because maybe, I'll give two examples. Maybe the person doesn't care about you. And they care about making their point. You could be any human being. You have no face to them. You have no identity. 
You have no meaning beyond the words that you can validate from their mouth. And they will respond very poorly to this question because it points exactly at their deepest shame. That's the prediction. You shine a light on something somebody is doing and they didn't put it there themselves. You're going to get two reactions, honesty or anger. Both of them are responses to shame. So if we go back to the Garden of Eden analogy, I don't see how that matters. That's the fig leaf you put over your groin when you realize you're naked. You know why? Why it goes over the, the private parts? That's where stuff comes from. That's where stuff is made. That is the source of all reproduction. What I think. Which means when you say, I don't see how that's relevant, you don't say anything else at all. It's not a virtue. It's a declaration of ignorance. And it shouldn't be treated as wisdom, uh, at least not at face value. So now we've gotten the first step. I said how it could go poorly. Here's how it could go well. Hey, you know what? I can be an asshole sometimes. You're right. I should care what you think. Maybe I'll understand you if I take five minutes instead of half an hour telling you why I won't. <laughs> you hurt yourself and other people and people who care about that. They want to get over that and you can train it and you can practice it. And here's the thing. When you can practice something, other people can learn it from you. And it's easy. So that's not the answer to everything, but it's how to keep the conversation going with someone who cares about you as much as they care about themselves. And here's where it becomes useful, and we'll cover this in one of the later chapters. People with low self-esteem they will listen to whoever pays attention to them. And that's as good as it is bad, as far as the potential for good and bad go, because it depends on who finds them at that point. Those, those people have decided for whatever reason, I am less than you, which means your words matter more than mine. So if your words are better than mine, I'm just going to believe you. We have a different word for that. Trust. I is greater than you is greater than I. I trust you. And that's another recognition. It's, it's not good or bad on its own. It's an example. Maybe you're in a situation where this person has 20 years of experience. I trust you to fly the plane because you're a pilot. I'm not going to do it first and watch you to make sure you've got it right. And I've never flown a day in my life. So that's where that would be appropriate. Now, say that someone has an experience where they got yelled at all the time for speaking up and they were taught, your words don't matter at all compared to anyone's ever. I just don't. That's not how you're, you're, it's just not you. You is less than I. And they say, okay, I'm less than you. And they listen. Well, you can do things with that. And everybody does. Everybody. If you're bad, you'll recognize this and trade momentary platitudes for servitude. You will give them just a little bit more than they will give themselves, and you'll extract a heavy price. That's what a tyrant does with that. That's what a bully does with that. That's what a manipulator does with that. But maybe that potential is not just there in a vacuum. Because here's the other thing about good people. Good people know what it's like to feel bad. Too many good people say you is greater than I. It's wrong. 
U is equal to I. It works wrong in both directions. But here's why it works wrong worse when everyone just does what they want. The bad people, they're fine for the time being. They're fine as long as they have a good person to feed off of. And it's easy enough. My words matter more than yours. Don't you care about me? We both feel bad, but I feel really bad. How come you're still, how come you're still talking? How dare you? How dare you disagree with this thing that's obviously right when you could be doing this? Kind of a heartless monster, are you? Well, I don't want to be a heartless monster. I don't think I'm a monster at all, but I better do something to calm this guy down and give the baby his bottle or something. So the good person, you know, they don't, they don't stick up for themselves. They get fed off. And it keeps the bad person who's doesn't have a problem with that going for longer than they should. That's what happens when you think someone else is more than you when it comes to matters of opinion. If someone says their opinion matters more to you than, uh, uh, than it should, and if someone says that they get to decide without negotiation what a conversation can and can't be about, do not trust that person. Do not trust anyone who cares about themselves more than they care about you when it comes to matters of intellectual honesty. Because they have proven they will choose the lie they enjoy rather than explore anything they don't want to with you. Measure that in small ways before you trust anybody with anything large. And you don't even have to create the situation. You just have to notice it. Pay attention. Is that person telling me I can't talk about certain things? Or are they asking me to talk about things that I don't want to? Two very different dynamics, very different feelings as well. The person who's declaring relevance doesn't know they are making the other person feel small. Or maybe they do know and they don't care. Because you can't hide I is greater than you. Because two people want different things and one of them is having final say. So let's talk about that a little bit more. The reason it matters is because when a language has a similar way to say the same thing, there is a universal truth hiding there. And the fact that this truth is so widely avoided tells me it's a big one. And it was. I didn't see it. I look for things like this. I look very hard. It's, it's like if I was an archaeologist, you know? Those guys dig for fossils. I dig for patterns like this. And this pattern is very deeply buried beneath shame. The one place you know, that's at the bottom of the emotional spectrum, by the way, your frequencies. If you never get your frequency low enough, you will be blind to when you should be ashamed or when you're hiding it. You won't even recognize it as shame. Why? Because you've never experienced shame on purpose. You have no baseline. Oh, I don't like that. Better get away. I oh, feel a lot better now. Oh, I just better sleep that one off. I just don't talk about certain topics. Most topics don't matter. <laughs> I just put everything we don't care about, put it in a pile. What if someone wants to go through that pile? Fuck them. <laughs> what if they ask really nice? Fuck them nice. <laughs> the only thing we don't do is say yes. There's only one counter. Because people understand when they're not in a fair fight. That is the best thing your gut brain can do. 
And I don't mean best as in terms of a choice. I mean, that is the thing it is best at doing. Your gut brain exists for one thing, to tell you when you do and do not have the upper hand. It does other things. You can measure it other ways, but that is its function. When do I do and when do I don't? That's the gut brain, which means you can't lie to it because it doesn't care about your shame. It doesn't care about your memory. It doesn't care about your past trauma. It cares about keeping you alive because if you go, it goes. The whole ship shuts down, which means if you change the dynamic of power, People who are experiencing that dynamic of power will know that you want that because currently there is a stalemate. Evolution doesn't happen in stalemate. Homeostasis happens in stalemate. Ecosystems form that repeat, patterns repeat, history repeats itself. All because of one phrase that nobody touches. I don't see why that matters. Oh, there's no talking to you. <laughs> Here's how you change that dynamic of power in real time. And you will test a person. That doesn't mean you'll win. It means you'll test them to go beyond their limits and find out what they're made of is why this is a good test for trust. I don't see why that matters. I understand you see why that don't matter. It might not make any sense. It matters to me, and I think it is connected. So the real question is, in this conversation, are you more important than I am when it comes to what we want to talk about? Will you hear me out, or will you refuse? Because if you're going to refuse, I should never be here at all. Because you're not talking. You're not doing anything except repeating what you already know. So what's it going to be? Are we equals in this conversation for what we want to talk about? Are each of us going to listen when we don't want to, to what the other person has to say? Or are you the one calling the shots and I don't have a say? That's the test. And the price of that, you no longer get to call uncle without knowing that if you are asked to explain yourself and you don't know how, you're being a giant ass. You might have to be a giant ass with a big smile. I know how to make that work. You just draw a smiley face on your butt cheeks. <laughs> You can be an ass with a big smile and make people laugh, but guess what? You're still an ass. You're still not taking other people seriously. You just made them feel good about it. <laughs> you protect yourself with humor. Oh, you know, I, hey, I'm the king of that. I'm the king of fools. That's what the fool does. They cover up pain with laughter. Why? Because anger doesn't work anymore. <laughs> they burned through their anger. Now they have to laugh to grow. The fool hates dishon. The fool is the person who learns how to hate the right things. Learn to hate the things that fool you. The fool does not like himself when he doesn't understand. The fool gets angry. The fool feels dumb. They've got good habits. They'll try to figure out why. So this one, and I'm just going to wrap it up because the topic's almost ending itself at this point. This is a very core topic. It touches everything. It is the heart of the philosophy of communication. It is the only thing you need to understand to know if a person values you as another human being or if you are a bit part in the show they are putting on. 
It is how you find out if you matter. Because if you don't matter, stop giving them attention. All of it. That behavior will die. Because that's how evolution works. You now have the advantage. You have said, I am willing to go where you will not. And I only want to be treated as good as you treat yourself. Are you man enough to be me? Or do you want to be by yourself? And as long as you do not look back, they will have no choice but to die or to follow you, metaphorically speaking, in their minds. Their growth is the thing that's alive here. Hopefully most of you have a concept of metaphor by this point. Anyone who's taking this out of context, I'm gonna pull this clip. Hopefully you have a concept of metaphor at this point. Why is my explanation not as good as yours? Do you think you're better than me before we've started this conversation? Aha. <laughs> It makes being an asshole impossible. Well, you can still be an asshole, but you can't lie about why anymore. So the rubber meets the road. Um, and then to, to kind of close the circle on that, to use the Bible metaphor. The Bible has some great metaphors. That is the gift that keeps on giving if you're looking to talk about different languages of consciousness. There's a lot of them in there. And they're very meticulously spelled out. The math checks. I have, I have tried harder than atheists to disprove the Bible as far as what it can teach. I don't mean, can I read this thing like a history book and say, I can find the tomb of Moses. He's going to do this thing and I'll take his staff and part the water. No, what I mean is, do the metaphors in the book agree with themselves? Do the messages tell a story that is consistent on many different layers of metaphorical imagery? The answer is yes, from my perspective. And I've done a series that's done a few episodes like that, that kind of lays it out. And you will see that series mirrors a lot of the translations I've used in cognitive physics. So the, the, the metaphor that's good for the Bible here is uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Everybody's got opinions on Sodom and Gomorrah, but let's skip to the part where the city has been already rained over with fire. All right. Because that's what you have done by pointing at this problem. So let's skip to this point in the future. You don't matter as much as, or are you saying that you matter more than I do? You have just rained fire down on everything that was in front of that question. Because that question is the one that's being avoided at all costs. So you're going to get all kind of belly aching. But until you get an answer that is different from anything that is not an answer to that question, you are asking the right question. The fact that your question is being denied means that there's pressure. They sense the change in power happening. And the only thing that can stop it is if you let up. Hey, I understand you're worked up about this. I really care about this. I'm not moving this conversation forward until we talk about this one thing. Do you matter more than I do in this conversation? Will you listen to me? Do we have equal say in what we'll talk about? Yes or no? That's the raining of hellfire down on the city. That destroys the city. Sodom and Gomorrah, they're gone. You got to build something new. So why do I bring that up? Because here's how you make it fail. Here's how you undo all the work you just did. Here's how you get sucked in too. Remember Lot's wife. She looked back. She became a pillar of salt. We have a phrase for that today. Oh, that person's extra salty. Metaphorically, if you make that claim and you drop that bomb and you take that away, and there's only one way to hide from it, 
is you got to hide behind what's relevant because that's where everybody goes. If you go back, if you even look back, you will be salty too. And you've done nothing except destroy a thing before moving on. You destroyed your honesty and integrity too in the process. So that's my, my view on relevance. Relevance is not a declaration. It's a negotiation. And it's wise to find out if the person that you are talking with is willing to negotiate in good faith. And let me, let me lay out the cost here, because this is where the rubber really meets the road. We're not talking about money. We're not talking about survival. We're not talking about a beach house. We're not talking about 30 years at a dead-end job. We're not talking about competition for something. We are talking about the creation of hypothetical thoughts. The cost is zero physical input, period. The cost is making your brain go in a place it is capable of going, which means if that cost is too high, there must be a price that's being avoided. And if that price is felt strongly enough, they will invoke the almighty. I don't see why that matters. I'm not going to talk about it. I'm greater than you. That's when you stop and ask the question, why? Let me give you an example of a good answer to that question. Well, okay, here's why I don't think that's relevant. When I talk about, when I think about this, I think about this and this and this and this and this and how these all work together. And when I look at your question, I see it does approach this, but it ignores this and this and this and this and this and this. So we can talk about your question, but your question is made up of smaller questions, which make your bigger question not a complete question in my eyes. So if we wanna talk about the thing you wanna talk about, we can, we will. We need to talk about what I think it's made of, which now changes the dynamic of conversation back to me because now I need to understand more about you. And I need to ask where your relevance comes from and how you don't see the relevance that I do. And that's an example of someone who just knows more. All right, they got your number. You have said a thing that shows so much of what you don't know that they have you completely in a box when it comes to that concept. And we've talked about how to notice that with the higher and lower dimensions of consciousness. If you have one extra dimension of consciousness, that is possible and very easy to do, especially if someone's stuck on a one track thought. If their consciousness is one dimensional, which is towards or away my reactions, having a two dimensional or three dimensional up to fifth dimensional, which is as hard as I can go, um, but maybe there's people out there probably who are better at this than I am who can do even more. I just, I lose the, the I don't have the visual thinking to go anymore. But the point is, you can do that and be right. But you're not right all the time. You're only right for that moment. So every time a new moment happens, you got to start over. You got to update that measurement over time. So that's, that's when the answer is good. The person wasn't avoiding the answer. The person wasn't avoiding the why. It wasn't an avoidance at all. It was a, a redirection. It was a question of how do you build your relevance? It's a request for information. It's towards. So you can deny relevance if your goal is to move towards it. And to move towards it, you have to realize sometimes if someone's really far off track, you're going to have to go off the beaten path and walk with them so they know how to find you. Because if they knew how to find you, they'd be next to you already. And if you won't go where they are, you have decided where they are doesn't matter as much as where you are. I is greater than you. 
they're not going to find you on their own unless they're really good at doing that, like I am. But that's because I don't like being alone. I had a fear of not connecting, just driving me on until I learned how great connecting with people is. And now I do it on purpose. But fear is a powerful motivator. If you learn how to be afraid of the right things, you can do a lot. That's all I had. Just so happens that being afraid of dying alone is a good reason to learn how to love other people. <laughs> and if you can do it good enough, you can learn how to get rid of all those other fears and use them when they're appropriate instead of just carrying them around all the time. If you don't know how to use something, you won't put it down because you won't have it when you need it. If the number of things you don't know how to use is too great, you will be so weighed down, you won't be able to use any of them at all. I don't see why that matters. No, you don't. There's another good one. Someone's being an ass. No, you don't see why that matters. And I'm getting sick of that. Maybe you could do it with a little more damn patience. Maybe this conversation would be so damn hard if you wouldn't fight me every step of the way instead of giving me the hypothetical ability to exist. You're going to cut the shit? You're going to have some real talk with me? Are you going to keep putting up fences like a little crybaby? I can't talk about that. I'm so sad. I don't see why that matters. Your feelings make me feel bad because you're asking questions that I don't want to talk. That's another way to handle it. It's uh, I would use that approach to somebody who was being overly aggressive. Because it's, in a, it's not strength to run. Why would I do that? Because I would make them run from me. I would make them run from the thing they care about more than the thing that is holding them back the most. If I believe. So when is that? I don't do that all the time. I'm not a giant asshole. My assholery always has a function and it's always to try and make it end for everybody. Which means if there is an idea that is right on the other side of something that they don't want to talk about, but I do, they don't have to talk about it. Here's the thing. You get to decide I is greater than you. You get to decide I is less than you. You are not free from the consequences of either one of those decisions. And let me tell you, I is equal to you is the only translation that works on every mental level. So if you want to be right, there's a lot of books out there to teach you how to be right at a lot of different things. This lecture has a lot of ways to be right, but they're very small. You got to have all the rules in place to know that this is the right thing for the right time. When I say right thing for right time, I'm pointing to a specific goal that I've laid out ahead of time. So even then, my stuff is useless. If your goal is not to connect with other people, that's why I don't have a problem sharing these techniques so openly. You can't abuse them if you're self-destructive at heart. In fact, if you try to abuse them, there is a good chance you'll learn how you're lying to yourself and either become better or give up. Because you won't be able to look yourself in the eye. So if the goal is to know more, the goal is to make more friends, the goal is to love, the goal is to expand your consciousness. The phrase, I don't see how that matters, cannot be said without properly paying the price for using it. If you're responsible, that price is explaining how Taking this detour helps you move towards human connection. It's not a denial. It's a detour. That's the difference. If the road is permanently closed, you have permanently closed your future. Everything that lies beyond that point 
unless no other human being has ever found why that matters. You're missing out and you're doing it to yourself. All of it to protect. I is greater than you. So quit it. Or don't. That covers everybody. Uh, that's all I got on the topic. This was an exciting one for me. People make a lot more sense now. And in the short time I've been using this uh, little correction, this little communication translation matrix, everybody I know who I can trust to keep their word and be honest has responded positively. Because the bullshit detector doesn't lie on this one. The logic is airtight. The cost benefit analysis is too big to ignore. Because I'm the one powering it. By example, I give it up. I gave that up a long time ago. Why does that matter? I used to say that a lot. I also used to be a lot dumber than I am now. When I started caring why people thought what they figured out, really understanding it the way they did, two things happened. One is I connected with those people. Why? Because they understood that this person, for whatever reason, was saying, I am equal to you. And in this, you are greater than I which are both things that the body responds to positively in terms of sensing power and advantage. That was what I gave. What I got back was information that permanently filled in a dark spot. Information I was avoiding on purpose without realizing it. Dots that I needed that were tied to things that felt uncomfortable to say about myself that I would never find because I never went to the places that made me feel uncomfortable about myself. And finally, because I didn't know anybody who was strong enough to stand up to that and say, Tom, here's why you're wrong. Nobody gave a shit enough to give up their own power to really make a point of that. I had to figure it out myself. So I can tell when this is happening and it's, a, it's not, a, a, not a useful thing. It happens all the time. So when it comes to understanding I is greater than you, you can equal me in this, it's easy. Just gotta do what I do. But when it comes to crossing the threshold, of exploring irrelevant things. And the topic is exploring irrelevant things. Unless you do what I do, I am greater than you in that. And that will always be true until it changes. But that change is completely up to you. So be wise with it. Be wise with your irrelevance. Know when to hold them. No one to fold them. No one to walk away. All right, that's all I got on that topic. Tony? I'm thinking a different title because. Um, it's different. Wait, so I want to, from my perspective, I want to tell you what it's different from. I have unified the three languages of mental thought in six words. If you can improve that, I want to know how because I do. <laughs> but that's what I—that's what you're competing with, in my perspective. Um, I would change the title because uh, when I heard indifference and when we spoke about indifference, I had to translate it every time into. Um, I don't want to know about. Wait, what's that? I don't want to know about this thing, or I don't care to know about this thing. 
uh, uh, with the situation in mind that someone else wants you to, as opposed to indifference is, where indifferent? no one wants you to. And because you say I'm indifferent to it, it's your expression. That's what this. No, no, no. I mean, if you were indifferent, you wouldn't care if they told you. You really care that exactly. they don't. Exactly, and that's why. Yeah, exactly, and that's why I think we might need a different title for indifference, maybe. Not for relevance. Yes. So the indifference lecture is the one you would have. No, not for relevance. Oh, I can't. Well, you can make your own lecture on yeah. this one. I think relevance is. So, so let me let me let me reiterate. The reason I'm choosing that word is that phrase but maybe, is present in every language. Maybe I, have I didn't it wrong. get to pick that what was phrase. the title of this one? What's that? Um, which phrase? Like, which yeah. phrase again? Go ahead, Tony. We're we're just we're our 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 timelines are, are what is this? Our mental vibrations are slightly out of phase. So I'm gonna stop talking and let you go. Well, I just asked what phrase. That's all. Oh oh. Uh, anything that says that doesn't matter. Anything that that's not relevant. Why don't we talk? We don't want to talk about this. I don't think that has anything to do with my goal. So it's a denial of. So when I say relevance, I mean connection to the conversation at hand. There you go. Denial of relevance might be, denial of relevance is what my mind took it to whenever we were talking. So it, so it can be a denial, but it can also be an acceptance that you enforce. Denial and acceptance. But the enforcing is what makes the a difference thing. for me. Right, but remember. It's the enforcement not is what makes or. a difference for me. It's the. So ask why it makes a difference. There's a there's a there's a shadow boxing lesson in why it was one and not the and not both. And it's probably tied to writing frequency down. If I had to guess, I've seen your shadow a few times, and it doesn't like to go down in frequency. Um, yeah, I saw a meme this week that said something else about shadow in the group. Like once you keep bonded with your shadow and have like two happy girls or whatever. And I was thinking about how I'm part of a community who actively bonds with our shadows. And so whenever you talk about shadow and uh, from your perspective of it, I usually have to translate that to, that's right, normal people are that way. And then so you have to ask God, why they're my bonding friends. with their shadow. If they're bonding with their shadow, so it will stop tormenting them. That is different than bonding with their shadow and making a equal and trusting alliance. One yes, of them and I'd love for you to, and I'd love for you to um, see my reference being to the one or to the many ways both fit or either fits best. I'll, I'll say that that it, remember way back when um, yeah you first said you had vibes. I explained it in terms of um, I trust you to believe it to be any one of the million things that I think yeah. it could be. And um, if it has the correct rules that box it in and it's relevant in a very specific frame of mind, it exists as a hypothetical truth that I can understand. Um, all I would want to do is know where does it begin? Where does it end? Where does it succeed? Where does it fail? And how does it change over time? And does it work in forwards and reverse? Because that's how causality works. So if you can't walk it backwards, you're missing steps. That's the way I see it. That's a, but that's not my, oh, that sounds so wise, Tom. That's a hermetic principle. Come on, that's been around. I just stole it. Uh, it's the same thing as saying, is if I run a video in reverse, I'll watch it happen backwards. It's not wise, it's obvious. What isn't obvious is why people can't run their ideas in reverse and figure out they're wrong when they fail. Well, that's easy. I am greater than time. I am greater than causality. I am greater than, well, you fill in the blank. If you're great enough in your own eyes, you can fill in whatever you want with that. Uh, because that's what hides behind the fig leaf. That simple declaration that egotistical, and I mean egotistical in the negative way, and I mean negative in the sense that it is biased. It is an improper measurement that will carry itself through the entire problem. I'm greater than you. 
Um, but yeah, I love hearing all the different, I've grown so much from all of the stories that I've, I've got from, from groups like yours, from people like you, uh, from you specifically, uh, from, from, from people that didn't want to give me the time of day. I learned so much from people who hate me. Because if you want to really understand hate, mix it with love. And watch what hate does when it's confused. Hate expects hate. When it's safe to love someone who's acting like they hate you, watch how fast they figure out they're the one that's the problem. Or how fast they decide to leave you the fuck alone. Not because you did anything, but because they sense they do not measure up in that situation. And you must be avoided or destroyed. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, this I like this one. This one makes a lot of people make a lot of sense. And it finally provides that battering ram that breaks the boundary of, are you going to treat me like an equal or not? Was that ever your intention? Something else. You said at some point that the only way two minds can communicate effectively or to the best highest potential, whatever, is I equals you. But um, I see a lot of ways uh, that could be different too, though. Um, the saying um, you're, you is, um, or I'm less than you. I did the conversion, remember? There was a variable substitution that I put in there to fill that gap, which made it only work in one direction, which was a vulnerability, by the way. So I didn't say you couldn't do it. I said you couldn't do it and know that you're getting it right on your own. Trust is the, the, the substitution variable that lets you accept information you don't necessarily agree is relevant. So if the ego is weak, and it accepts everything because a stronger ego told it to, then that person loses their agency because they've willingly given it up. And their agency becomes whatever the person who is using their trust puts into it, which is why I think it's important. If you can see that connection, you do everything you can to march that person straight to the point where they say, they matter as much as you do instead of I is less than you. Because that's what they need to fix most of their problems. My opinion. I definitely see how that could work for most people. Yeah, well, I, I, I we want to help most people. <laughs> I don't want to help everybody. I got to leave. Well, how, how selfish would it be for me? to try and take all of the goodwill for helping other people for myself. That's, oh no, Tom, you, got, you can't be selfish with goodwill. Of course I can't help everybody. I just wanna help most people. I'll even limit it to most people I come into contact with. That should leave a few billion for the rest of you. Yeah, I'm doing my part. That too. What's that, Tony? I said, yeah, I was thinking about that too. Like, do I wanna help everybody? Like. I wouldn't mind helping everybody, but um, something else you put in there. So we're talking about um, relevance and indifference and stuff. And something else that uh, kept rolling around was um, was the indifference being uh, like that. Like I can't help everybody, or if I try to help everybody, then I might help less people. So I choose to be indifferent towards asking for my energy in specific ways to help everybody in a sense like well it's 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 i think the difference there strategic. for me i don't know what it is for you the difference for me is is the person asking for something that will help them or are they asking me to make it easier for them to avoid their problem well i'm thinking about bigger than that like i'm not thinking individually i'm thinking like help well am i I guess it's an overlap of the two because you have helping everybody, quote unquote, everybody. I think it's the same thing. Everybody meet. Okay. Well, okay. I, I guess the difference is trying to go out to meet more people to help 
as opposed to helping those on your path? I think that if you are helping enough people energy. the right way, their path will find its way to you. Because that's how people looking for things works. I think I think the right way in that situation is a nice subjective Christian to fit just about anything in. The, uh, the specific lecture that that references is cognitive quantum entanglement. How to engage the shadow into seeking out what it needs. Um, well, I was thinking. That's I was the path thinking, it takes, the path of meeting. Um, I was thinking, dang it, what was I thinking? I was thinking the, um, dang it, I lost completely where we were because I'm 10 minutes from home and no, no, I got you. Wanted to make sure I made this turn. You, you were talking about the difference between finding people and people finding you. Or I was, you were talking about finding people. I was talking about people finding you. And I was. Oh yeah, you said the right way. Concepts. Yeah. Yeah, you said if you work the right way, um, a phrase like that um, is measured in terms of success, though, right? That way, the sure. right way. That way, if you're successful, then it was the right way. But if you're not successful, then we can say, well, something was probably not right about the way you did it. And that's that's a fair thing to say. Like just because that's a thing that can be said doesn't mean it doesn't deserve a lot of criticism. Most of my personal growth has come from looking at things that didn't turn out how I thought they would and assuming that part of my what goes around was coming around wrong. And I needed to figure out how to trace that back to its source. Yeah. That's yep, and I can follow. That's that's a that's a good one. That's a hermetic principle too. That's the here, that's the causality. Causality. If you if you practice it enough times and pay attention to the right things, you'll be able to tell, as far as you're concerned, what you do causes what. You just gotta be able to spread the decisions out over time. A thing you did a week ago comes back today. Putting that together is tricky sometimes. You don't realize your influence and how long it takes your influence to go around and come back to you. So it gets mixed in with everything else. Chaos, soup. It's just the collision of every decision you've ever made rebounding all at the same time. Did you see that there? So, all right. Um, anything else to add before I before I end the lecture, Tony? Sorry, I didn't know my mic was still on when I um, asked her, so I just had to break kind of hard, and she said I scared her, but it was okay. far away, no worries. And I saw it from a mile away. I don't like but, um, my don't... car does fast things either. Sad on my side. We got. <laughs> We had the robot voice for a second, Tony. I lost you last time. I gotta get these kids to bed. Okay. Oh, I no, I was just I, I just said I'm ready for bed too. Okay. All right. Well, if there's nothing to add, then I'll I'll, I'll call it a night. And uh, Tony, your participation today, the the things you asked at the end, I think were really important for bridging some some of our own mental languages. Like, hey, this word means this. This means this to me. This is how I understood that. All of those are Rosetta Stone moments. So, so I realized something else about our lectures that parallels meditation. Okay. Um, so a lot of times in meditation, one of the first steps is to focus on nothing or focus on your breathing or focus on one thing and to push away all the other thoughts. Well, I realized that in our lectures and stuff, especially when I don't have any questions at the end, um, there was a lot of thoughts or extra thoughts that I pushed away to focus on the lecture or you know stay in this uh stay, to stay in this vibe yeah and so and so uh whenever i lose things now i think about it like that and i compare it to meditation yeah meditation is the isolation this is just uh this would be more of a guided meditation i would say or a, a meditation that focuses on one point that changes instead of the same goal every time which is just to okay. slow down I've got a med I've got a bunch of lectures on my meditation list. Like I've got I've got a meditation music list, and then I've just got a meditation list, and that's 
lectures or positive yeah. uh, motivational speeches and stuff like that. I would be very interested if, and, and you could pick whatever format you want. I do the 90 minute lecture because that's how long it takes me to talk about one thing, the way I understand it completely. It just seems to be how much information I fit on a single topic before I start to circle back. But if you had um, like certain videos where you could give a 20 minute lecture and not really depend on anyone else to, to jump in, that would be concentrated perspective from Tony. And that would be a useful thing to me because right now the perspective of Tony is little bits and pieces here and then what does everyone else think? So uh, if, if there's room in your life for something you know a lot about, which is the things that we could have the best chance of success of filling that amount of time with some things that aren't nonsense, I would be very interested to hear uh, a many or any part series on how you understand meditation and how many different ways you understand meditation. I think that would help me a lot. Hmm. Think about it. Well, the problem with that is uh, even part of what you said here about like um, uh, when you give somebody else control over your perspective or something, um, you kind of take, you know, embody them. And, you know, my thing is living in other people's consciousnesses. So me talking about meditation for 20 minutes would be stories about my meditations and how they've been and how I felt and whatnot. Yeah. I can talk about that for 20 minutes. Do you want to do it on Monday? I'd love to. I'd love to do it as many times as you can talk about it differently. And if that's a different video every right. time, different technique, well, different guru, different goal, different style. Well, that's, that's easy. You can do that every week. There you go. So that's to me. So the nuance is which is what is what is where there's value. I think the best way to get where we want to go isn't just me talking about meditation, though. It'd be you having a question or a part of it that you are looking for. Like, I would a, ask like me. So what I'm looking for is if you made a map the, of meditation as you understand it, what would it look like, and how could I find my way around without you? I wouldn't. I would give you the book that I learned from, The Crimson Riddle and um, the Hayoka. So that's you know, the part that I'm that saying, I that, that, uh, which is why I wouldn't want to say box you in. Maybe it's a five minute lecture. So well, and that's why, and that's also why I said you need a specific question. Um, I think right. back to your birthday and on your birthday, the way I remember it, we had a, we, we were talking and then You were trying to get something out of me that you didn't feel I wanted to give because you thought that I couldn't. And I said, yes, I can. Like, that's not hard at all. I can definitely do it. I just need right. you to want to do it. And for you right. to take the responsibility I think I was, for it. I can up so I agreed to. And then you said, and then, and then you said, um, and then you, you phrased it in a way as if you were, and you asked me to you know, go down a path. And I did. I felt like I 100% went down that path, except I said I did it for you. And that was a problem. And that's when you said you felt like you were talking in circles or having different conversations. So right. I wasn't um, getting you. I was getting myself back. So in here, so with that in mind, I had with me it. talking for meditation for 20 minutes, I think it's important you know what you're looking for because Tony talking about meditation for 20 minutes to the general public or in general or about generalities is going to be who he's trusted the most to fit the most people in the most general way. And that to me is removing as much as Tony as possible. Well, how much of me is in my lectures? <laughs> All of it. Uh, I'd say, uh, that's what I want. If, if that, if that's the quickest answer. That's the language I understand that I think is the most, uh, efficient for transferring the most amount of information. Uh, and the only thing that gets in the way of it is lack of confidence in what I believe. Uh, I is equal to I. That's another important measurement. I didn't talk about it in this lecture because it's a different topic. I is not equal to I, well, then 
i is equal to everything else, and then you're infinite, which is great if you're doing that on purpose to guide you. It is a lack of navigation if you're doing it because i is a thing you won't look at or talk about. So for me, the measurement now is for Tony, i equals i, towards or away. Tony, can you talk about a thing as you understand it without any guidance or structure? Or do you need guidance and structure provided to have a conversation. And let's say that even that is true. So we'll hypothetically separate it to say, I could do that, but I don't want to. Then my question is, do you have the ability to do that in your head? And the only place that you can do that in is, is in your head because while it exists there hypothetically possible, it never, ever, ever makes an appearance in the real world. Those would be my two questions. They're not fair questions. They're very pointed questions to point directly at why doesn't I equal I? But I think it's an important one to ask. We can go back to meditation on this Monday. I want to uh, so bad. Yeah, let's uh, let's work it on out. The logos, the I am. That's where a lot of my recent power boosts have come from, Tony. I believe, I am. People resonate because you're not the only one. In fact, it's so common that everyone does a version of it. They want to know what to believe because nobody knows. And when somebody comes along and they can really say, I believe and why, and here's how, if you're smart about it and you're not lying, and, you know, you make connections that way. I hope, I don't know, or else I'm lying to everybody and myself. Look at my life in 10 years. If I'm, you know, laying in the gutter, watch all my videos for what not to do. No matter what, I've given something of value. I'm either a cautionary tale or I figured something out. Probably it makes a both. <laughs> uh, anyways, Tony, thanks for spending time with me this evening. Thanks for listening to my words. Thank you for your questions. Um, there's, You're welcome. Uh, I think two left. Two or three left. You think there's two left, and then we're done. Yep, next week. Um, and I will see you inside the dojo. Thank you, brother. Love you. You're welcome. I love you too.